Hi, everybody. Um, good evening and welcome. Uh, the Costume Society of America thanks you for joining our Conversations on Dress author interview. You can find the other installments of our series on our website and on our YouTube channel. I'm delighted to welcome you to our, as to be our moderator today. Uh, my name is Graham Wetzbarger. I'm the Vice President of Technology for CSA and a volunteer with the Conversations on Dress series. Without further ado, I would like to introduce Elizabeth Block, who has taken some time away from her book launch to give our membership a little preview. Welcome, Liz. Thanks for having me, Graham. Thrilled to be here. Awesome. Uh, me too. So Liz holds a PhD in art history from the Graduate Center of SUNY, a master's in American studies from Columbia University, and has spent the past 22 years working at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Liz, I think you're maybe the only CSA member who has a window overlooking Central Park. Um, you are in such prime real estate. I'm very jealous, especially with your proximity to such amazing art and um, obviously costume as well. Um, I have two questions for you before we begin. 22 years at the Met. That is an amazing tenure. Um, <laughs> What do you account that to? And is that is that kind of retention common at the Met? It just seems. Well, what I like to say is that there's a 25 year club, but I'm not old enough <laughs> to be part of it yet. <laughs> um, it's it's quite, um, it, it is a place where people stay for a long time. Although that tide may be turning now that people are enjoying remote work, but I'm glad to be on site as much as I can. Yeah, that's amazing. Can you tell us, um, why you put this book together. This is your first book. You've been published many times, but this is your first book. Um, can you walk us through a little bit of your inspiration behind it? Well, a couple of years ago, I was writing an article on John Singer Sargent's painting, very famous painting, Madam X, which is here in the Met. And I'm sure you can, I'll show it to you when we get to my slides, but I'm sure you can all envision the, the black, slender dress, the Madame Gautreaux with her red red hair pulled up in a chignon. And I had come across a notation that said the designer of the dress was believed to be Felix. And I said to myself, we need to know more about him. And I started looking into the Maison Felix in Paris and it just opened up this entire world of Parisian couturiers who uh, I had never heard of before and then I found all these American women who were patronizing them and I just started putting them together, makers and buyers. Amazing. Um, yeah, they can fall down those, those wormholes, right? And we just, uh, we never know what we're going to uncover and that's pretty great. Um, so I hope we get to explore that in your presentation and let's jump right in because I know we have so mm -hmm. many beautiful things to look at. Absolutely. Thank you, Graham. I'm just, I'm so thrilled to be here. And thank you to the Costume Society of America for inviting me. Um, I'm just so thrilled to have this chance to show you dressing up and the passion that went into making this book. Um, the topic of American women buying French fashion in the 19th century has been endlessly fascinating to me. Um, yes, these were wealthy women who were spending family money but they were doing it with intention, and in many cases, a surprising amount of practicality and frugality. The book works to shift the focus off of one or two well-known male designers, and instead to take a close look at how the patrons could make or break careers. So the goal of the book is to expand our understanding of the French transnational fashion system at the time, and to begin to think more deeply about the equilibrium between the creators of couture and the patrons of couture. Now let's get to know some of these women and their fashion. Here we are looking at Edith Kingdon Gould in a portrait by Chartrand at the left and on the right, the actual red velvet dress that she sat for in the painting. I was so pleased to get permission for both of these images from the private owner of them who is a descendant of Gould. Edith Kingdon was an actress who married the banker George J. Gould, the eldest son of the railroad baron J. Gould, in 1886, and she became a socialite overnight. She patronized Parisian couturiers as well as local dressmakers in New York. 
And here in the painting, she's wearing a fur stole that survives today in the collection of one of her descendants. They are lucky it survived as Gould encountered several incidents of theft over the course of her years in high society. In one incident, some of her dresses worth up to $2,500 each, which is approximately $75,000 today, were stolen from her dressmaker's shop where they were being altered. Paintings like this one help us add to the list of designers' names while also studying the shopping practices of American women in the tycoon families of Gould, Astor, Vanderbilt, Skirmerhorn, Glessner, and more. Most of us have heard of the House of Worth and possibly Doucet, but we also want to know about others who are doing brisk, high-end business like Felix, La Ferriere, Paquin, Lippmann, Rodriguez, and Pasco. Here we see a bustling shopping day in Paris. The House of Doucet is on the left, and if you look to the upper left at the signage on the shop, you can see the O, U, C, and T of Doucet. So we're just missing the D. Um, and it, it shows a bustling shopping day in Paris. We see a shop girl in the middle holding a dress box for her client as the client lifts her skirts to not get dirty on the street as she enters the carriage to take her home after a full day. And Liz, this is kind of like, like 19th century product placement. <laughs> Like you would see today on social media or uh, television or movies. It's so interesting. Exactly. Was that piece commissioned by Doucet? Oh, no, no, it wasn't. Burroughs was doing um, all these impressionist paintings of, of the city life. Genre and, scenes. Yeah, genre scenes, and you'll see more, more to come. Uh, but he was one of the ones who had his eye on fashion for sure. Amazing. It is. American women would travel once or twice per year to Paris to shop, and several Amer American families owned or rented homes in Europe to make their stay more comfortable. In this caricature from a French newspaper, we see a husband balking at an invoice from Caillousseur, one of the couturiers in the fashionable district. Husbands, in fact, were balking all over the world, and we have many caricatures of, like this of American husbands doing the same. Uh, but I show it also because the image of the delivery man is a good reminder of how many people were employed by the fashion system. They included designers, seamstresses, and salespeople, but also cleaners, delivery men, and shippers. Graham, this one's for you. Trunks and, shippings and shipping were big businesses. Um, we have surviving invoices from a wealthy woman in Newport, Rhode Island, um, showing the cost of her shipping shipping all of her trunks home with the garments that she had bought in Paris to Newport. Um, and she also has bills adding up for cleaners and um, and it seems just as and, and you can just see how much is going into it. So I couldn't resist showing this Vuitton trunk um, and on the right an advertisement from 1888. It's amazing. This Trianon stripe was their first attempt to defer counterfeiting. Uh, yeah. which then evolved into a checkerboard and then evolved into the famous monogram pattern. Uh, because even in the 1880s, uh, Louis Vuitton was such a well-known name that people were copying them. Yes, and copying was such a major issue. And I have an entire chapter in the book on um, copying, counterfeiting, and smuggling. Okay, here we have Mary Endicott Chamberlain. Um, she was from Salem, Massachusetts and she married a British politician named Joseph Chamberlain. She did her shopping in Paris at the houses of Worth, Ravnitz, and Halle, and she, um, for her wedding in 1888, she wore a gray traveling dress that was probably made by the House of Worth. And there's a historian named Philotta Billard who has traced Chamberlain's shopping practices in Paris, and she found that Chamberlain visited Paris at least every 18 months to order clothes. And during a trip in 1890, she ordered the gray dress of silk with velvet sleeves that we see on the right. Um, it was made by the House of Worth and she wore it for her painting by John Everett Millet that we see on the left. Um, and there's this really terrific letter that we have of her writing home to her mother. You know, she was a new bride and probably 19 years old. 
writing home to her mother, you know, she was commissioning this dress from the House of Worth and she was describing it and asking for her mom's opinion, saying, you know, what, what do you think? What should I do with the sleeves? And does the color sound right? Um, it's just such a window, a window into these women's worlds. And here she is in a different, very different portrait, this one by John Singer Sargent in 1902. And uh, while she was getting ready for the portrait, she she needed help again, um, making a decision for what to wear. And so it was a joint decision between her, between Sargent and also the House of Worth. Um, I think they came up with a really terrific decision with the cream colored silk satin dress and the turquoise um, accents. And that she writes home to her mother that the House of Worth made the dress within four days. Now that's spending power if you can get uh, a house to make a dress for you within four days, I think. I wanted to show an example here of another designer who needs more research done. This is a designer named Melanie Pascone, and the dress, we see a dress by her on the right, and the dress is being worn by Frances D. Drexel and the painting on the left by Drake. Um, although it's, as you can see, it's been, you know, it had interchangeable parts as most dresses did. And for the painting, she chose to, um, you know, show more of her, uh, to just to show more of herself, more, more skin. So she took the, the sleeves off and the lace off. And with this dinner dress by Rodriguez, I touch on another major topic in the book. And that is the multiple nationalities that were represented within the fashion system in France in the 19th century. The names we see on the labels, on the shop signs, and in the city directory represent France, Austria, Switzerland, Spain, and Italy. Rodriguez here, Madame Rodriguez, was of Spanish descent and was active from at least 1875 to 1879 and was known to have worked with several actresses, but surviving garments are exceedingly rare. And this beautiful, beautiful blue and red dinner dress is from the is now in the Kyoto Costume Institute, and um, it was a big get for me to be able to uh, talk them into sending me, allowing me the rights to reproduce the dress in the book. It's it's gorgeous. The photography is gorgeous. And speaking of internationalism, I want to touch on the Great Paris Exposition of 1900 which drew some 50 million attendees, as I'm sure most of you are familiar with. Uh, here is an evening suit by Paquin, who organized a palace of fashion at the Paris Exposition with garments by multiple designers. One of her gowns adorned a 15-foot plaster statue that stood by the main gate to the exposition. By 1907, the year that her husband and business partner had died, Paquin's shop in Paris employed more than 1,300 people. And here we have an evening suit. This one's in the Met. And I had said to Graham that I'm so, I, I just love having the opportunity to show so many different angles of the garments that I couldn't show in the book. So here, um, I, I, love, I just love the back train of the dress at the right that you see, and also the back of the sort of up collar that makes me think of sort of a Disney queen collar. Back to Barreau, one of our favorite painters for this type of study. This one is in front of Maison Paquin, Paquin. And again, with the cutoff name, so the upper right, if you look at the gold lettering, you can just, you can make out the P-A and part of the Q. And um, we see a pair of women turned out in their summer afternoon dresses and hats, perhaps discussing their shopping excursion. And another customer emerges from the store, glancing at the women as the doormen look on. Meanwhile, a carriage has arrived to let a to let off an a woman who has also come to shop for the day. You can just see how much commerce was happening on a daily basis in the Couture districts. I can't resist showing this ball gown by Paquin. This is also in the Met, and you rarely see the back view of it. Another major point in the book is how interrelated the various tentacles of the fashion system were. So it was not only couturiers, but also milliners, shoemakers, hairdressers, and perfumers. 
and they all needed to pay attention to what the others were doing. Several couturiers began business as milliners, expanding from hats to gowns, only after their names had been established. In fact, the Maison Félix had started with hairdressing. In this painting, we see a milliner walking on the street during a busy day. She keeps a quick pace while holding two hat boxes, holding her skirt up from the dirty street and an umbrella. If you cast your eye to the middle ground, you see a street cleaner um, adding to the sense of the hustle and bustle, which it, it seems as though it might have been a rainy day earlier. On the subject of milliners, we always have to mention Degas. Um, this is a wonderful pastel at the milliners, also in the Metz collection. Degas had a fascination with showing women's hair and hats, so millinery shops became a favorite subject of his. Here we see two customers, possibly a mother and daughter, or two sisters trying on hats. We know that they are of equal class standing and not a shop girl with a customer, as shop girls were not allowed to sit down while working. And a beautiful French bonnet um, shown from the side view and the back view, also in the Metz collection, and it's crafted with silk, beads, feathers, and wire. Now to Félix, who I mentioned started the whole inquiry for this book. We believe that the Maison Félix designed the slender black dress worn by Madame Coutreau, the subject of John Singer Sargent's painting, Madame X, and she was from a New Orleans family. I included an entire chapter on the Maison Félix and its American clients, and I introduced the owner, Emile Martin Poussineau, who was called Félix and who was also instrumental in the fashion exhibits at the Paris Exposi Exposition of 1900. This is an extraordinary opera gown by Félix um, from about 1887. That, was, that is a recent acquisition of the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising Museum in Los Angeles, and they um, graciously allowed me to reproduce this image in the book. The Maison Félix shop was at 15 Rue de Faubourg Saint Honoré, and it was spread out over, over several floors after its renovation of 1894. It was finely decorated. You can see that it's carpeted. There were mirrors everywhere, greenery, plants, lots of seating, um, the height of comfort for people coming into the salon. And they would have live models circulating throughout the rooms. The Maison Félix was a household name in the United States. It was spoken with in the same breath as Worth, Paquin, and Doucet. And there's just so much, so much to learn about him, them, and so much to find. Um, as you see on the left, they had a short-lived uh, gazette, you know, or yeah, it's not exactly a catalog, but it, you know, fashion plates, but just for their firm. Um, that ran for a few years starting in August 1897. Uh, and that the Maison became known for catering to a desirable slim silhouette, an, hourgla an hourglass silhouette that we saw in Madame X with her slim, fit, slim fitting black dress. Um, and that we also see here on the left in the brown dress. Um, I hear browns coming back. Maybe you all can tell me if that's true. And on the right in a um, burrowed painting that really functions as a fashion plate in and of itself, even though it's an oil painting. One of my favorite chapters in the book is called Gowns and Mansions, and it explores how fashion was inextricably linked to interior space. It uses the Vanderbilt's elaborate ball of 1883 to demonstrate this point. These photos are from a book celebrating the new home of William Kissam Vanderbilt and Alva Vanderbilt at 665th Avenue at 52nd Street in New York. And of course, it's long been demolished. Um, but I love these images. Usually we see the black and white um, as we see on the left of the Grand Mansion. But the Strand book has these beautiful color images in it. And on the right, you can get a sense of how um, lush the, the spaces were. So the greenery, the carpets, the stained glass, um, it almost looks like skylights at the top. Um, and then leading into the salon room at the right where you can see paintings hung salon style. 
I would be remiss if I didn't mention the electric, the famous electric light dress that was worn at the ball. Um, so at the left, you see the electric light dress uh, that was worn by Alice Claypool Gwynne Vanderbilt. And on the right, you see her seated uh, with her husband, Cornelius Vanderbilt II. He's dressed as a duke. This dress is in the Museum of the City of New York, and it's rarely exhibited, but I had a chance to see it in person about two years ago at the museum at FIT. And it was extraordinary. I just looked at pictures for so long, um, but I, I, I wanted to point out that it's a rather petite dress. The woman wearing it was probably about five foot two inches. Um, it supposedly had a battery in it that made it light up in some way. I could not see the battery, but I did see lots of tinsel, which you can see here at the shoulders. And the tinsel for sure caught the light and made the whole dress glitter. And um, the party photo on the right, it's worth mentioning that, you know, although, you know, it's black and white, but it's so evocative of the, of the party. And these, this was a whole genre of photography that um, I'm starting to study more of now, but um, Jose Mora was one of the most famous photographers for party occasions. And he was booked exclusively for the Vanderbilt Ball. And so he took lots and lots of these stage photographs, but um, he had such an eye for getting expressions and capturing the costumes. On the right here is another photograph by Mora at the ball of Mrs. William Seward Webb. And she's wearing a Hornet costume that was very popular in the 1880s um, because people got their costume ideas for from books like Ardern Holt's Fancy Dresses Described, you see the hornet plate on the left. And um, Seward wasn't the only one, Seward Webb wasn't the only one wearing the hornet that year. We have a couple of other photographs of women who were wearing nearly the same outfit. Um, and it speaks to how closely people heeded Holt's recommendations. And of course, we can't talk about the Vanderbilt Ball without featuring this extraordinary cat costume worn by Kate Fearing Strong. The headdress was a taxidermy cat, and the skirt was composed of white cat tails that were sewn together. Finally, she wears a collar bearing her nickname, which was Puss. How could we not end on that? I'm providing my contact information here. I would love to stay in touch with this terrific audience. Awesome, thank you for that. Those are beautiful um, insights into, into a, a, a time that uh, I think we all wish we could visit. Um, you mentioned brown as a color trend and I really, <laughs> <laughs> yes, and we, we're seeing it everywhere in all different shades. Um, it's happening. Thanks, it's happening. I think a lot of it has to do with um, with sustainability and people using natural dyes. So you're getting all of these like brown tones, ochre tones um, and things like that. And, and they're, even if they're not using natural dyes, the, having it be an earth tone, I think just kind of symbolizes environmentalism. Sure. So it could be, it could be brown washing. That's fascinating. I've been what do you Yeah, we're seeing a lot. Um, wonderful, well, thank you for that. Um, we have a little bit of time before we're going to go to audience questions. So I have to ask you a few more questions. Um, so at the Met, you work in publications and editorial. So, and you have published in journals and, and many things, but going into writing your first book, I would say you probably had a head up or a hand up um, in the publication process. Um, in writing this book and getting it published, what were some things that you learned that you thought you knew, but you didn't? Um, how was that journey? Um, well, one thing I can say is that I was definitely right that um, that doing your own index is not fun at all. Um, at the Met, we're very lucky um, that we have indexers to do the index at the end of the book so that people can find, you know, subject headings and names and everything. Um, it comes at the very end of the process and uh, these academic publishers just don't have the budget to hire out professional indexers. So they ask the authors to do it. 
and I was not looking forward to it. And in fact, it really was very difficult and challenging and it always comes at the very end of the project. So um, when in doubt, hire a professional indexer. Um, I think that's something that technology could solve for. I really think that we could develop an algorithm or a piece of software that can pull these keywords and your page numbers and all of that. So, um, yeah. well, you know, the, and, uh, the professional indexers use software. Um, okay. But when authors do it, they're doing it manually on Excel. For sure. It's not fun. No, not at all. Um, so also in your process, uh, you applied for and were rewarded several grants, the Eileen Ribeiro grant for the Association of Dress Historians, the Pasold Research Fund grant, and the Association for Art History grant. Um, can you tell us how essential that was to your process and was that, uh, it, it, I guess, intentional as part of your process? Right, so it was, intentional because I insisted on having a full color, high production quality book with MIT and I really pushed them as far as they would, would go. I work, yes, I work in art book publishing at the Met and we do such beautiful volumes. Um, they're extraordinarily well produced and I wouldn't settle for anything less. So I insisted on full color, which meant that I needed to cover the cost of all the images. So, oh, okay. um, and because there's not, there are 90 images in the book, I was responsible for sourcing them, uh, clearing the rights and paying for them. So the grants were integral to allowing me to get the book at the highest possible quality. And the sure. publisher- and the, I'm sorry? The publisher required uh, that I do so. They, they required that authors cover the cost of their own images. So these grants are just, uh, you know, they're lifelines to authors who want to, to produce color books. And especially in the fashion history world, you know, we're all so stymied by the cost of some of these images. And there's a good reason why the pictures are expensive. It's because there are professional photographers taking them. So it's an imperfect process right now, something that I'd love to work on um, through the College Art Association uh, so that we can be producing more high-end fashion history books. Amazing, and now look behind you, your book is right next to all those other books published by the Met and I would say is of equal quality. So um, you set out with a goal and you figured out ways to accomplish it, congratulations. Thank you. Um, now, you also told me in our, in our previous conversations that you are a journal editor and are passionate about the peer review process and working with applicants throughout that process. Um, the CA, CSA Costume Society just announced that they are extending the call for papers for the 2022 National Symposia to November 1st. So we still have time out there for people who have never submitted or are hesitant to do so. And do you have any advice that you can give them? I do. Um, so. I work as the managing editor of the Metropolitan Museum Journal. I'm holding up one example. Now I'm going to hold up a second example because the covers are so beautiful and these are full color publications. Um, we come out once per year. Hold on. And um, it's a double anonymous peer review process, which I really believe in, and that means that the authors do not know who the readers are and the readers do not know who the authors are. In fact, the only people that know the names of the authors when the submissions come in are myself and the secretary of our board. And our board is made up of curators, conservators, and scientists. And we accept um, a range of submissions from ancient through contemporary art, but our standards are very high. Um, and one aspect of the submission process that has come out in the past couple of years that's been integral to getting papers through all the way through to publication is the importance of the abstract. So we require that authors send in an abstract along with their article and with all their images and all their references. And we circulate the abstracts at the beginning of the process to the board so that we can see what subjects are coming in. So I would, and this is, goes the same, this is the same for if you're presenting at a conference, a symposium, um, really 
Yeah, we your, do the same abstract uh, policy. Yeah, abstract policy. Put your best foot forward by sending by really putting time into your abstract. So by that I mean with the title of your paper at the top of the abstract, you'd be surprised at how many people forget to do that. So keep your title short and sweet. Um, try to avoid colons in the title. Try to avoid a subtitle if you can. Make sure the title says what this paper is going to be about. Um, tell us what you're going to say and then say it. Exactly right. And also tell us what your argument is and make sure mm -hmm. you have an argument. Make a sure you have a point of view. Make sure you're not just describing things, but that you're arguing something from the beginning to the end. Our board members look for that. And um, I would say try to avoid including any quotations from secondary sources or even primary sources in your abstract. It's such a short amount of space, usually 250 words. You want to make sure that it's entirely your voice for those sure. for those for that word count, and also stay within the word count of whichever organization is 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 um, asking you to stay under 300 words or what have you. Follow the rules. That's right. Yeah. Cool. Um, Sue Parker just ordered your book, Liz. Congratulations. Oh, okay. <laughs> another sale. Thrilled. Thank you. Um, I, I know you just had your book launch yesterday, um, and that's a pretty big deal. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, thanks for asking. It was extraordinary. We had the book launch out in Central Park. It was the perfect fall day with the blue sky and, you know, enough sun coming in and just, you know, family and friends and a terrific bookseller um, from Word Bookstores. They're in Brooklyn and in Jersey City, and they just did a marvelous job. And I was just signing books left and right. That's amazing. And on the note of signing books, if uh, if Sue wants to get a nameplate signed, she can simply email you, right? Please do. I would love to sign a nameplate. Um, if you want to dedicate the book to someone, I can dedicate it to them and, and sign it, and I'll mail you the book plate. Just give me your mailing address um, so that your friends and family can enjoy the book directly from me. Awesome. There you go, Sue. Um, let's see. Um, speaking of the book and it being available now, it's available at Penguin, but it's available at other booksellers nationwide. And you were telling me something that um, some of your publishers and distributors have been talking about. Of course, we've been hearing so much about supply chain problems. Oh, I got the best email the other day. It was so the book launched on the 19th. <laughs> that sounds sarcastic. <laughs> I know it wasn't. It wasn't. It was. It, okay. it was. I know it did, but it was. It's this year. Um, so the book was launching on October 19. So around October one, I was just reading all these articles in the paper about supply chain issues, and especially for book publishing, um, paper shortages, truck driving shortages in Europe, and and you know labor shortages in the printing world. Um, so I was worried. Um, but then I got an email from MIT Press saying not to worry that my book was in the warehouse and was being shipped. So it's in stock and it is available at booksellers all over. And of course, you buy wherever you, wherever you would like to. Right, come on, we all sucker for 10% off. I would go for the 10% personally. Always, yeah. Um, <laughs> but you're right, I mean, December or October is the new December this year. It's like you really have to have a lot of foresight with whatever, um, you know, business or hobbies or whatever you're in uh, to make sure that you um, you yeah. have what you need for, for gifting season. That's what I'm hearing. And we're air shipping in here at the Met some of our latest books to make sure we have them on the shelf. So it's a real thing. Uh, we had a great comment from Mariana uh, that mentioned Alice Vanderbilt's dress, uh, where she carried um, a, a torch that lit it up. So perhaps in the, yeah. over time, the the battery pack got separated from from the gown, or it's stored someplace else to keep it safe and not damage the garment. You know, I think that's an excellent point. The battery there there must have been the battery in the torch. Um, the torch was not on view at the Museum of the City of New York, but um, I know that they also have gloves and stockings and um, and other paraphernalia from that particular outfit. Um, twenty two years at the Met. There's a twenty five year club. Do you think you're going to make it to three more years? 
I think the chances are pretty high. Um, I, I had to wait 12 years to get this office, so I think I might stick it. <laughs> for sure, for sure. Brian has a question I'm asking you to talk a little bit about the smuggling section. Um, I think smuggling is, well, I, I don't think it's amazing, but I too study smuggling and and and, and all of that in, in my research in anti-counterfeiting. Um, he's doing research as well, but with menswear and tailoring. Um, so, you know. Excellent, yeah. It's, probably you know different customer but probably the same family right you know, the husbands are doing the suiting the women's are doing the the, the gowns etc i love that um right so this book is all about women's um fashion but short, yes men's fashion i mean it's it's a whole world and you, you know some of these images that the men at these costume parties are just extraordinary they really went for it uh, but yeah, the smuggling, um, it's such a rich topic. There are so many stories in the newspapers about women coming back from Europe. So they would come back on the steamer ships into the port of New York or you know wherever else they were getting off in the major port cities in the US. And they didn't wanna pay the extraordinarily high duties, the taxes. And so some family members would smuggle the the goods in so they would um hide the you know hide dresses underneath whatever they were wearing or they would have a family member hide a new couture dress and one woman did it with her wedding dress she had her father say that it was not a new dress um and that it had that it was a used dress to avoid paying the taxes on a brand new couture garment um, there's, you know, lots of stories, images of the the, um, the customs agents rifling through um, trunks and, and looking for hidden garments. There were, um, you know, in these in the trunks or suitcases, people were sewing in hidden pockets, and you know, you could fit accessories in there too, because those were those were being taxed. So you could fit fans, gloves, you know, anything flat in there. And um, to me, it's just remarkable that these wealthy women were looking to save money. There's just this unexpected aspect of frugality that, that runs through it. Uh, and there's a case where Mrs. Astor, Mrs. Um, yeah, Mrs. Astor comes back with two Felix dresses and doesn't want to pay the taxes and tries to talk her, try, tries to talk her way out of it. Uh, it doesn't work and she's taken to court and she just she just refuses to pay the taxes so she gives up the dresses it's remarkable there there's so many aspects of it's so bizarre but i think we still see that today yes. um in 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 tax cuts or in tax loopholes or in all different things um and it's often those with the most who who are perpetrating these uh, uh, cr crimes um, with suiting, you know, and I guess with, with women's wear too. I imagine that there could be smuggling as well as the like raw goods or the materials um, into Paris, into London, etc., uh, from other countries to, before manufacturing uh, to save uh, on, on tariffs there. But the duties for finished goods, I, I imagine, were always higher. Finished goods were high, and so in the smuggling stories, it's not just the the patrons, the buyers, but it's also um, sort of the lower end, lower end um, seamstresses and dressmakers from, and particularly I looked at downtown New York. So like the Sixth Avenue dressmakers um, had a lot of, had a lot of scenarios going on where they were getting themselves over to Europe and copying patterns and bringing them back and then, you know, making knockoff goods. Yeah, um, right, all that copying we, we were talking about. Um, Barbara asks, will you be discussing millinery and the modelists who were favorites of both Worth and American women? So we touched on millinery, especially with Degas and his depiction of, of, of um, women in hats and the connection between the garment designers and the accessory designers. Um, but uh, are there... <laughs> I scratched the surface of some of the accessory designers and um, what's fascinating to me, um, I mean, all of it's fascinating to me, but 
that they were sharing they were often sharing space in the same building so the famous mm. you know, some of you can probably envision the famous um house of worth is you know five six stories high um but i found in the city records and in advertisements that there were accessory makers and um lingerie sellers who were share who were leasing space in the same building so they were they were neighbors I mean, they were walking up and down stairs <laughs> passing each other so there were partnerships that we just haven't studied yet that we don't know about yet but um more so than the yes some of the favorite milliners um like vero i look at and um i don't go into too much in the lingerie or the corset area but i get heavily into the hairdressers so the coiffures mm. the relationship between hairdressers and couturiers it was extremely close and the milliners too but they were all looking at what each other was doing and you know the if the milliners didn't like the hairstyles that the coiffures were putting out they would get testy and if the you know the hairdressers didn't like the styles that the designers were putting out they would get testy so um again with this equilibrium within the fashion system we have to sort of take a three 360 look at what all the different hands were doing but um so for hairdressers i look particularly at an at a new one that i that a new to the research that i found august petit and then also lentarik um who was very close with worth and who guillaume lentarik had this enormous hairdressing um you know emporium and and also sold accessories, but you see in like Harper's that, and in French magazines that the two of them were paired constantly. So Worth and Lentarique, and I thought, well, who is this Lentarique? And then I looked into him and it opened up this whole relationship between the couturiers and the hairdressers. So more to come on hair for me, for sure. Awesome. Um, yeah, there have been a couple of books published on hair and coppers in the past couple of years. We actually did a, um, a webinar on the book hair uh, that that came out uh, earlier in 2021 and it's it's really fascinating fascinating the um the intersection between society class race and and yeah. uh style right um yes. style there um hi joanne how are you i'm fine thanks <laughs> for joining us now? okay we can I, it wasn't it wasn't a question it was a comment i got the book okay. yesterday I, I received the book yesterday and i am so impressed with it it's so thorough the research is so thorough and so impressive and so wonderful and some of it's just gossipy which is wonderful too but i did want to say <laughs> <laughs> well a lot of it has to be but i do want to say that um alva vanderbilt's costume she was the hostess at the vanderbilt ball in 1883 was taken from a painting in her in the family's collection in the art gallery it was of a venusian patrician and that's what the costume was based on thank you thank you very that's much. amazing um do we know where that painting is now no I, think it's still I, have, the... I don't know no there were there were um sketches of it in the frick uh library that's where i found it in the first oh place. fascinating Terrific. Yeah. The, and then, you know, the, the relationship between the portrait paintings and the dresses um, and the inspiration that went both ways. But sure, for the costume for the Vanderbilt Ball, um, you, you can you can see that in some of the costumes and the costume descriptions for the ones for which we don't have photographs anymore, that they were looking at Velasquez, they were looking at um, at Rembrandt, they we're looking at all the old masters and pulling inspiration from them, both for the women and for the men's costumes. But I will certainly look for more. Well, I love the fact that it was a painting of her own in her own collection. <laughs> right. They're just sitting there in their drawing room, looking up at their Rembrandts and Velasquez saying, that would make a beautiful gown. I you love know, that's it. something we can all relate to. Um, <laughs> I love the gossipy bit, but also the throw too. Thank you, Joanne. I appreciate that. Um, in closing, Liz, you know, we talk, thoroughly researched book. How long did this process take you? My son asked me the other day the same question. Um, it took two years. It took two years for the research and the writing. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I signed the contract 
with MIT Press in August 2020 when no one knew what you know the future would bring. But I am so grateful for them for thinking toward the future. Yeah, they had faith in you. That's amazing. That's they great. did. And also that they hadn't given up completely on book publishing just because we didn't know what the next two years would bring. So sure. I'm just so thrilled that the project is out and that the book is in your hands now. Well, wonderful. Um, we already had one great review of the book, and I hope everybody else goes out and get a, gets a copy on it. I'll be ordering mine right now. <laughs> um, Liz, I just want to thank you again so much for your time this evening. Um, you can go get back to the frivolity of your book launch and, <laughs> um, and, and, and continue celebrating until you get down and start working on that next one, huh? Absolutely. I know you have a, a big manuscript behind you on that chair that I promised we wouldn't talk about. But <laughs> There's always galleys around here, let me tell you. <laughs> well, very cool. Well, we look forward to reading the book. We look forward to seeing what else you come out with. And um, uh, thank you for being a member of CSA. And thank you for everyone who's watching, who's a member or just joining us and perhaps might want to become a member in the future. Thank you very much, everyone. And have a wonderful evening. Thank you again, Liz. Thank you, Graham.